Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, this is the Welcome to COVID-19, a discussion with Chief Judge Thunheim. I'm Marnie Theron. I co-chair the FBA White Collar Committee with Joe Thompson from the U.S. Attorney's Office. I'm with the Lathrop GPM firm, and Lathrop GPM is hosting and sponsoring this webinar. Before we get started, I have just a couple of housekeeping items to go over. First, we welcome any questions that you have. Please use the chat feature that you see at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions, and we will do our best to get to as many questions as we can with the time that we have remaining. Um, second, this webinar is being recorded. It will be available for viewing at some point following the presentation on the website for the Minnesota chapter of the FBA. All right, as everyone is well aware, COVID-19 has radically transformed the legal landscape and how and where we're litigating cases. Today's discussion will focus on the recent changes to court operations in this evolving climate. We are joined this afternoon by Chief Judge Thunheim of the United States District Court, District of Minnesota. On behalf of the committee, I would like to thank Judge Thunheim for generously agreeing to participate in this discussion. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Marnie. I'm glad to be here with everyone. So our first question, we have seen the various press releases and the general orders that have been issued since March 11th. Can you provide an overview of the court's COVID-19 response um, from March to the present? I certainly can, Marnie. Um, it, uh, it hit us rather quickly back in March, and I think the first indication we were gonna have problems with normal operations was the fact that our primary detention facility at Sherburne County was really on lockdown which meant that lawyers, uh, criminal defense lawyers, could not meet with their clients. And that had a significant impact on whether we can move forward with criminal proceedings. Uh, so we immediately uh, suspended criminal proceedings at that point in time. Uh, that was the first general order uh, issued back uh, in early March. Uh, with the passage of the CARES Act, that allowed us to start holding hearings by video which has been uh, a real uh, asset for the court to be able to move our processes along. Um, overall, we really have switched to uh, much more of a, a video uh, environment here. Um, we have, uh, we're holding civil hearings by video. Virtually all of them are by video now. It took a while for some of the judges to adjust to moving out of in-person hearings. And we still have a few in-person matters in the criminal duty area, the individuals who are being brought in, but we're trying to do all of that by Zoom hearings now as well. And we may have successfully uh, gotten to that point where we're not having any in-person hearings at all. In the criminal area, uh, if a defendant uh, consents, we can go forward with hearings as far as uh, even sentencings, but we have to have consent first. Those who are not consenting, uh, we have suspended the time deadlines uh, and uh, we're looking forward to making the decision next on what we do uh, on July 6th. <laughs> Classic mistake, I was muted. <laughs> it sounds like uh, you said that you immediately suspended in-person hearings and actually criminal cases altogether. How long did it take to start the cases moving again once you kind of had to halt operations? Well, we were doing some by video and when the passage of the CARES Act, uh, which was I think the end of March, uh, first part of April, uh, we, we jumped into holding video conference hearings right away. We were set up for that. We had video conference links, which took about two weeks to set up between the courthouses and Sherburne County, Washington County and County and Douglas County in Superior, Wisconsin. Uh, so that we had good solid uh, video links 
also a video link into the, the Marshall cell block in Minneapolis so we could hold hearings there. Then with the passage of the CARES Act, uh, we started moving quickly. Uh, the Judicial Conference really has not supported uh, Zoom, uh, but uh, we did our due diligence on that and we have, we just, just that Zoom for government, which is you have to be licensed to have that, provides the necessary security for our hearings. And so we, by early part of April, we were starting uh, hearings, and, which has gone really, really well, how to make Zoom work well for us. Um, you mentioned um, a little bit ago some extra, or that you needed the defendant's consent to proceed by video. And I do understand that the Cures Act also requires some extra findings. Uh, before you can proceed with certain hearings. Um, can you explain what those extra findings are? Yeah, um, the extra findings are involved in a change of plea hearing or a sentencing hearing. Uh, earlier hearings in the criminal justice process does not require the extra findings. Uh, but you know, first and foremost, we have to have consent of the defendant after the defendant has consulted fully with their lawyer. Uh, so we have to make findings about that. And we do that at each of the hearings that we have to make sure that there has been consent and the defendant understands that they have a complete right not to consent. Once you go to a change of plea hearing or a sentencing hearing, you have to make findings that uh, the, pr the process has to move forward. Uh, and if it doesn't, there would be serious harm to the interest of justice. That's basically the ultimate finding that the judge has to make. Um, we have instances in which someone is going to get, uh, for example, a time served sentence and they might be already in detention. Uh, obviously, there would be serious harm to the interest of justice to make that person stay in detention for a longer period of time. But the findings usually involve uh, the presence of the COVID-19 virus and the possibility of in-person hearing causing infection to people. Uh, we need to protect the health and safety of everyone. I mean, theoretically, we could probably override the lack of consent uh, with finding if there was really an urgent need. I don't believe we've had to do that as of yet. And I think about 75 to 80% of defendants are consenting to proceed by video. I know I've done seven sentencing hearings already by video. And uh, from my perspective, they've worked very, very well. Um, you mentioned, you just, you just mentioned seven sentencing hearings. Have you done um, any hearings that have involved witnesses? And if you have, have they also appeared by Zoom? Yeah, I've had several hearings where we've had uh, a witness, uh, uh, the probation officer, uh, and they've appeared by Zoom and that's worked out fine. Um, the magistrate judges are the ones that primarily have the issues with witnesses, and I think that that process using Zoom has been going fine so far. I think uh, in cases where there is significant witness testimony, we may not be getting consent to proceed by video, uh, but I don't see any reason why we can't use video uh, for uh, witness testimony. Uh, the Zoom, uh, process works pretty well. You can see and hear well. Uh, the defendant can participate privately with his or her lawyer uh, in the separate room function. Room. Uh, using it work well. There's an interpreter function that works well on Zoom also. And we just haven't found, once we got to know how to use it, um, we haven't found any drawbacks to, to using Zoom. But I understand if there is a significant uh, uh, set of testimony by witnesses that there might be more difficulty and more reluctance to proceed. But we're encouraging proceeding by Zoom even with witnesses. And I had no problem in the cases that I had. Um, do you have a sense of what the capacity is that the courts are operating at now? That's a really good question. Um, you know, I think that all of us uh, judges are proceeding with civil hearings uh, using video, and I think we're keeping up fairly well with the, uh, the demand for civil hearings. In the criminal side, 
Uh, I'm think I'm, I'm just guessing here, but I think about 75 to 80 percent of the the criminal proceedings are moving forward right now with consent. So there's uh, there's there's some that are not moving forward. Keep them on hold now and sometime after July 6th. Whether that date will hold or not, that's something we'll assess probably by the middle part. Of the um, but obviously, we haven't been able to have jury trial. And that's uh, that's an issue. We've started working on developing a, a safe process for jury trials. Uh, we we're not we don't have an agreed upon set of procedures to use for jury trials. But uh, we have some trials scheduled in late July, which are probably the first jury trials that we we need to move forward with, if at all possible. So we're going to be working on developing that. So capacity-wise, I would say that we're at 60 to 65 percent right now, uh, with a big hole in our processes, the lack of jury trials at this point in time. And that's the, the issue there is about being able to bring in uh, jurors safely and uh, pick a jury safely. Uh, I've got a bench trial coming in a couple of weeks, uh, which uh, we will use the uh, Zoom for all of the witnesses on that. I'm looking forward to trying that and figuring out how to do that. Uh, but uh, to answer your question, I'd say we're about 66 percent capacity right now. Uh, is your bench trial a criminal trial or a civil trial? No, it's one of those uh, those Hague Convention cases where I have to make a determination as to the uh, the domicile of the uh, the family, so that uh, uh, either our country or another country can make the determination of child support and all those issues. Um, what do you, what's the status of the grand jury? <laughs> Well, that's that's a real bright spot. Uh, we fa in fact have a grand jury here working in in the Minneapolis courthouse as we speak today, um, and uh, we brought back uh, two weeks ago uh, the blue grand jury, and we had a good conversation with them in advance. Uh, I explained how important they were to the criminal justice process. Uh, Judge Schultz, who supervises the blue grand jury explained all the safety precautions that we were going to use for using two courtrooms and video courtrooms so there's sufficient distance. And we had great uh, enthusiasm and cooperation from the grand jurors and they returned quite a few indictments two weeks ago. They're back today. Uh, and based on our experience, we're gonna go forward with in June. We'll probably have as many as six days of grand jury work uh, the yellow grand jury will be back for two days, uh, the blue grand jury for two days, and the purple grand jury, which is the grand jury that I supervise, will also be brought back. So uh, we're hoping we get a quorum for each of those days and can proceed, because uh, even taking two or three months off at the U.S. Attorney's uh, Office, there's a, there's a backup, and we need to move forward. So we've been really happy with what's happened so far with our grand juries. Most, we talked a little bit, you talked a little bit earlier about Sherburne County, uh, a lot of counties, but Sherburne in particular has a lot of the um, federal defendants that are in custody. Um, how have you been working with Sherburne County to come up with ways for lawyers to make sure that they can be meeting with their clients and also appearing for um, court? hearings? You know, I've been really impressed with our partnership with Sherburne County. Uh, they've been very willing to work with us uh, and, uh, and to get around some of the obstacles that are imposed when you have a facility that really does need to be locked down to prevent uh, the, uh, the virus from, from coming into a facility where there's a lot of close contact among the detainees. Uh, there's ICE detainees there as well. They have a large population and there's been no uh, instances of uh, the illness uh, coming into Sherburne County as of yet. Um, what we have done is we've set up uh, rooms for the video conference links to our courtrooms. That was our first step with them in order to make sure that lawyers have the opportunity to meet with 
uh, their clients. We've set up, uh, we've purchased I iPads that have been set up. Uh, there's one uh, in two different rooms, in rooms in each of the two major pods at Sherburne County. Lawyers can schedule time. We actually now have 36 uh, time slots each day for lawyers to meet with their clients. They can, they can uh, share documents, uh, go over documents using Zoom, and that really is working well. Uh, I've been very, very impressed. We had to figure out what would work, what lawyers would trust, what uh, detainees would trust, and uh, I've been, been really, really impressed. Our Federal Defender's Office has been instrumental in getting this uh, taken care of. Uh, assistant federal defenders have been testing out different ways of having the meetings, uh, but it's really wide open now for criminal defense lawyers to be able to schedule time, go over documents, go over discussions with their clients, which are essential in the manner in which they formerly went to Sherburn County to sit in a room to meet with their clients. So we've had good luck. Our connections with Washington and Anoka County, where we also have detainees, has been very good. Uh, and as has been our connection with Douglas County in Wisconsin. And we recently have set up a, a good connection between uh, Magistrate Judge Hughesby's office in Bemidji and the Beltrami County Jail uh, so that we can, uh, we can do hearings up there as well. We're doing initials and probably detention hearings as well uh, with Beltrami County. What we've been trying to do is to reduce to the extent possible, the movement of detainees, movement to court for hearings. If we take someone out of Sherburne County and move them to court for, a, for an initial appearance or for a detention hearing, and we move them back to Sherburne County, they have to go into a 14-day quarantine. And there's only 24 quarantine beds there. So this doesn't work very well to move people in and out. So the video has been absolutely essential. And the connections have been very, very good. The sentencing hearings that I've done, including sentencings with interpreters, uh, have worked really, really well. And they've been uh, detainees who have been in Sherburne County. Now, we also have a process for individuals who are not in detention. Uh, we're using the uh, second floor conference room in the Minneapolis courthouse, which is outside of security. So uh, someone who's not detained can go in there. Uh, there's enough room for them to be in there along with their attorney, and they can be connected into uh, whichever judge is handling a, a particular hearing. So I did one sentencing from there as well, and that worked very, very well. So we have that alternative also to make sure we don't have to bring people into the courtrooms and into the courthouse. I've actually used that uh, conference room myself, and it did work quite well. Um, and I do, just for anybody that doesn't know and does practice in this area, I do believe that the federal defender is keeping the schedule, and so for yeah, both. Yeah for both Sherburne County and for that conference room. So definitely work through the, the federal defender's office. Sherburne County scheduling, uh, yeah, I think the, uh, the, the attorney meetings are being handled by the federal defender. Uh, there, there, there may be, uh, and the, our court hearings are being handled by Rebecca Parks from our staff, and she may be involved in helping with the scheduling for the meetings as well. So what have you found to be the biggest challenge so far? From the court's perspective? Well, uh, you know, it's an, it's an interesting challenge. Uh, the challenge really is reinventing how we do business uh, and making sure that we can move forward, uh, particularly in the criminal side of our work, because we, even though we have suspended a lot of deadlines, we still want to make sure that Sixth Amendment rights are protected and we can move forward as fast as possible. In addition, uh, at the, such time that uh, we are not in uh, an emergency, uh, we don't want to be overwhelmed with work that has to be done all at once. So we want to keep as much going as possible. Um, it's been a challenge to, to reinvent how we do our work, to get uh, all of our video connections working, to get judges and their staff accustomed to working through Zoom and other uh, technologies uh, rather than in person like we've always done it. 
But I think we've learned a lot through this process. So I've been encouraged by uh, the work that's been done. And I think that uh, some of these processes will linger on into the future because they work really well. The other thing that we've learned is how many people who work for us can do their work very well from home. And that's been a great learning experience for us. I think that's something that definitely will be part of our future uh, because uh, electronically we can do a lot from home. And we were well prepared, thankfully, for people working from home with laptops that can be plugged in at home easily. We'd gone, gone through a transformation the last two years to, to make sure that was possible. And so that part has been good. So I view this as a positive experience from the court standpoint to be able to figure out how we can best do our work in different ways. On a little bit of a lighter note, I think we've all seen uh, the articles about the judge in Florida begging attorneys to at least get dressed up for Zoom hearings and get out of their beds. Um, what tips do you have for attorneys that are appearing in front of the court by Zoom? Well, I wouldn't encourage them to do it from bed. That's not really a very good idea. And I think I might be at least slightly perturbed by that. Uh, you know, the attorneys who appear in federal court, as, as all of you know, are very professional. They do their work really well. I mean, I think we want to try to replicate the courtroom experience as much as possible. Uh, so I think uh, our judges will be uh, wearing their robes, of course, and wearing uh, uh, ties and, and shirts and ties, uh, just like they would in a courtroom. And, and our women judges will be dressed professionally as well with their robes. And I think that uh, lawyers should dress professionally as well. This is not uh, uh, beach wear or anything like that that they should be wearing. Um, I haven't had any uh, concerns about that uh, so far, and it's worked well. The biggest problem that I've had with Zoom, uh, and it hasn't occurred really in any criminal proceedings, but in civil proceedings, is some of the lawyers are at locations where they have bandwidth issues, and it gets hard to hear, and they kind of zone in and out. Actually, the worst problems I've had have been with lawyers who are uh, in uh, New York, actually where I assume a lot of people are using up a lot of the bandwidth there. Uh, but making sure that you have a strong uh, Wi-Fi or connected uh, uh, you know, connection with the court is probably the best thing because that's the most frustrating part of doing video is to have someone zone in and out and it's hard to hear and we have to ask them to repeat. It's getting better all the time. I think uh, lawyers are adjusting to making sure that they have the necessary connections to communicate with the court. And uh, so uh, that's the, the other problem is just making sure you have, I mean, I've been setting up by Zoom myself with my either laptop or with my iPad in the, even when I'm in the courtroom uh, because then I can look directly at someone. Uh, we. You know, the, the problem with the courtroom video conference, at least in my view, is the cameras are to the side. So I have a hearing and it looks like I'm looking off into the distance rather than looking directly at the lawyer. I don't like that. I like to be kind of looking at the lawyer, I like the lawyer to be looking at me. Um, sometimes I've had lawyers who, you know, I see the, uh, the ceiling of their office and the top of their head for a while and I ask them to adjust. And sometimes, you know, the, uh, a cat goes across the uh, screen, those sorts of things, those kind of interruptions. Just make sure, even if you're doing it from home, which is perfectly fine, just make sure you have, uh, you know, a professional setting and a good connection, and, and then you're gonna do just fine. I also had one hearing where a lawyer, this is from some other location, not uh, a, a normal Minnesota practicing lawyer, where he had the camera a ways away and he was, uh, he was looking down at his notes. So virtually the entire hearing, I saw the top of his head, which wasn't really uh, all that pleasant. Uh, so that, those are just some tips, just to make sure that you have the camera close enough so that you can look and have this connection uh, with the judge. And I think that'll work out just fine. 
So I think a lot of the lawyers online have actually not appeared in front of the court yet via Zoom. So can you talk a little bit about what they can expect the first time? You mentioned a minute ago that the judges will be wearing their robes typically and will be professionally dressed. Will people be in the courtroom? Where will they see the court reporter? Where will they see your clerks? Yeah, I think each judge is probably doing things a little bit differently. Um, I've done hearings both from the courtroom, most of mine I've done from the courtroom. I've done some from chambers. I've actually done a few from home as well. Uh, and um, we can use the virtual background. Uh, so it looks like we're in the courtroom. We might be at a different location. Um, my court reporter prefers uh, to, to be in the courtroom for the hearings because the sound system is so much better there. Uh, but I think we'll be doing more hearings from chambers or elsewhere in June. My courtroom will be used uh, on quite a number of days for grand jury uh, work, uh, so I have to be someplace else. Um, but uh, typically for the hearings, I've, I've been, most of them I've been in the courtroom. My court reporter has been there and my courtroom deputy has also been there who kind of is running all of the controls and making sure that everything works right. Um, we've tested doing it from other locations. We can do the whole thing remotely where we, each of us will be in a different location. My law clerk is also participating. Uh, usually you'll just see on the screen uh, clerk at the bottom and then you'll see no video and and it'll be muted they're just listening in to the the hearing uh the there's not a separate screen on the court reporter or the uh the, the courtroom deputy uh but if we had the courtroom scene uh like video conference used in the courtroom you would see them uh, but I think you should expect to see the courtroom deputy first, who's setting everything up and making sure it all works. And then you'll see simply the judge looking at you like I'm looking at all of you. How is the court handling clients or other observers that want to watch hearings? That's a good question. It was a big concern of ours from the beginning. Um, we, we started using uh, uh, the uh, AT&T conference bridge that we have, um, which we've used a lot in the past. For example, in my multi-district litigation cases, I've always had that bridge open and we can have as many as 40 or 50 callers who are listening into the hearing. Uh, and that's available. Some judges are using that. Increasingly, we're starting to use Zoom for that, where people can uh, can uh, participate in the hearing by Zoom, but we can mute them and make sure that they're not uh, uh, talking like they're not supposed to be uh, talking during a hearing. But I think it's a combination of Zoom and the audio bridge. But every hearing uh, that is public, and you know, 99% of our hearings are public, I uh, should have that audio bridge either through Zoom or through uh, the uh, AT&T line so that uh, people can listen into the hearing. So if you have clients who want to listen, if you have family members who want to observe something or friends, uh, they should be encouraged to participate by calling in. There's always going to be a number available. If it's not on the uh, schedule on PACER, uh, then you would just have to call the courtroom deputy and say, how can someone participate in the hearing and they'll give instructions. It's very important to do that. I presume that's similar with media. Have you had the media wanting to jump on some of these Zoom hearings? The media has the right to, uh, to participate uh, by listening and observing and we have had that. Uh, not as much as I would have thought, uh, but I think the media is busy reinventing themselves as well. So, uh, but it's available to them. Each, each uh, hearing is, is open to them to listen and to do their reporting. Can you share any information about your longer term thoughts about reopening in terms of even just mechanics, what it might look like when we finally return to the courthouse? Yeah, it's a little... Uh -huh. Predict. You know, we're taking our direction primarily from uh, our state health experts, and I think that's where we should be focusing uh, what we're doing. Uh, I think that the Judicial Conference was quick to declare 
uh, the necessary emergency to allow us to, to go forward with video hearings in criminal cases. That would probably end if the president declares that the emergency is over and we would lose that ability to do criminal proceedings by video and we would have to go back to in-person hearings. I think that for quite some time, some uh, aspects are going to remain. Uh, social distancing, probably wearing masks in our court house and in the courtrooms, uh, unless you're speaking. Um, uh, we're, we're trying to figure out a good way to hold jury trials in a way that makes sure that everyone's safe. Uh, we will be focusing primarily on the state guidelines for that. Um, although our, our state guidelines and state mandates do not apply to federal institutions, uh, we're committed to following the same advice that everyone else is to follow. And so we're trying to make sure we don't have uh, groups larger than 10 in any particular location at any time. We did start naturalization ceremonies yesterday. Uh, I did two of them. We did them out on the plaza in front of the Minneapolis courthouse. I had to yell pretty loudly whenever a truck came by. Uh, but it worked and we got 50 some uh, new citizens oaths, as they say. Uh, and we're planning to do a two week uh, binge in uh, June at the same location on the plaza. Uh, we have about 1500 new citizens that need to take the oath and we don't wanna wait any longer because uh, they, they have a, once they're citizens, they have a right to vote, which is important. They have a right to benefits, which is important. And so we want to make sure that we do that. It worked really well yesterday. So we're planning to do that later in June. Uh, but back to business as usual, that's, that's a little hard to figure out at this point in time. Uh, the predictions of a possible uh, second wave surge in the fall, you know, obviously has us concerned. Uh, so uh, for now, we're going to closely monitor what the state officials are telling us and uh, follow them as much as we possibly can. And who, um, who is working on this effort with you? I assume it sounds like you've been working closely with the federal defender in a lot of these efforts. I assume also with the U.S. attorney. Are these the, the stakeholders that you've been consulting with? Yeah, we, we, the judges have been heavily involved in, in all of this. Um, we've been working closely with the Federal Defender's Office, with the U U.S. Attorney's Office. We've been working closely with the Marshal uh, because prisoner movements are important. The Bureau of Prisons is also an entity that we've been working with. Um, Sherburne County, of course, uh, for our detention uh, issues. Um, you know, it's... Uh, we haven't been working as much with state court officials, but we are trying to make our facilities available as necessary to uh, the state court if they need some help too. I think uh, the wider the circle, the better. And uh, uh, I think it's, it's been going pretty well so far. I've been uh, really satisfied with every, the level of participation. We have many uh, phone calls each week, which have turned into Zoom calls now. Uh, we just had one with the probation office this morning, which plays a, a major role. You know, in terms of additional work coming to the court, uh, we have, I think, somewhere over 150 compassionate release requests pending right now at the court. These are uh, proceedings that in the past we never had to do uh, because we didn't have any authority. After the First Step Act uh, was passed a year and a half ago, we get some limited authority to do compassionate releases. Uh, but now we have significant authority and then we're getting flooded with compassionate release requests. And with the Federal Defender's Office, the U.S. Attorney's Office, the Probation Office, our Clerk's Office, uh, the uh, Bureau of Prisons, we're all working together to triage those motions to make sure that we get to the most important ones instantly. And I know we've talked a lot about criminal cases. Obviously, this is the white collar crime committee hosting this. And, um, and, and that's sort of been the, the focus of a lot of the general orders that have come out. But I know we have a lot of civil practitioners that are watching this webinar as well. And are, they are curious about 
I know you mentioned earlier that civil cases are moving forward. Um, do you have a sense of whether they are moving forward sort of on the schedule that was already set or at our judges at various places or how is that working? I think uh, judges are at various places, but increasingly judges are growing comfortable with using the Zoom technology for hearings. Um, we really have, uh, although we technically have prohibited uh, hearings from going forward in the courtrooms, judges have the ability to make an exception if there's something that really needs to go forward and needs to go forward with some individuals in the courtroom. So it's not completely banned. Uh, but uh, in my civil hearings are going forward as planned. Uh, I've had a few cases where the lawyers have requested an in-person hearing, and I've, uh, I've agreed to that, uh, but they've been pushed off to a later time. If we don't, uh, we, if we aren't able to move out of this certain, the emergency that we have right now, I think I will require those cases to be, the motions to be heard by Zoom. I think once you've done it a couple of times, you become comfortable with it. Uh, it, it works very well. I, I don't really see any drop off in any aspect of the work. It's always nice to see people in the courtroom, but at the same time, uh, this is as close to it as we possibly can get right now while keeping people safe. So uh, I think that by and large, we are moving our civil cases along. Uh, magistrate judges are holding settlement conferences using Zoom and they've become quite adept at doing that. Um, and there, uh, we, we, we stopped uh, some uh, uh, deadlines early on, uh, but uh, in cases where, in criminal cases where there's consent, we're able to move those forward really quickly and uh, on, the, on the normal schedule. And we expect that civil cases are gonna move forward as well. But there is an element of judge preference here. Uh, we understand that and some judges feel less comfortable in some cases with having a hearing by Zoom than other judges do. But I think, I think the bottom line is increasingly we're using Zoom more and more. And if you're ready for a hearing in a civil case in front of me, you'll get it very quickly. Uh, I'm not traveling anywhere. Judges aren't traveling anywhere. We're here, we're available, and uh, we can probably hold hearings more quickly than in the old world where we had a lot of uh, travel and other uh, things that kept us away from the courtroom. How have, uh, some of these uh, civil cases are very document intensive and involve exhibits. How have um, the exhibits been handled? Have lawyers been doing a screen share? Do they give you the documents in advance? Uh, the screen share, <laughs> to be used. I'm not sure anyone's used that uh, thus far uh, in uh, hearings in front of me, although it certainly would be fine. Essentially what we've been, uh, lawyers have been sending, if they have a PowerPoint presentation or if they have a certain exhibits that they want me to see, they've been sending that to my courtroom deputy, to my chambers, the mailbox, and then I usually have a printout of that in front of me. Uh, during the hearing. So I have that available to me during the hearing. And that's worked really well. So I haven't had any problem doing it that way. I wouldn't mind the, the screen sharing. I want all the lawyers to agree that that's appropriate in the case before I let that uh, go forward. Uh, but I haven't had a civil motion hearing where I've had uh, witnesses yet. So we haven't had to go through that process. That's relatively rare, as you know, most everything uh, for a summary judgment motion or a motion to dismiss is uh, is on uh, on paper, so we haven't had to have witnesses there, but it's theoretically possible. Does the court have any uh, thoughts about whether there will be an influx of new litigation after this COVID uh, nineteen situation? It's hard to tell. I was just talking with bankruptcy court this morning and they're, they're experiencing so far fairly steep reductions in cases, uh, but I think that'll change at some point in time here. The fact that Congress jumped in with the stimulus uh, package so quickly has prevented a lot of bankruptcies from going forward at this point in time. Um, we've seen a few cases um, 
you know, challenging the governor's uh, uh, orders. Um, at least there's three or four cases that are pending in our court. I'm sure that there will be significant employment litigation coming forward at some point in time uh, as a result of what's going on in the economy. Uh, and uh, the, the caseload mix might change a, little, change a little bit, and I expect to see more cases coming, which is fine because our civil case numbers have been down for a while. Fair enough. Is there anything that we as lawyers can do to assist the court in moving cases forward, criminal and civil cases, as smoothly and as efficiently as possible? Yeah, I think the best thing, the best thing that lawyers can do is to approach our process as it's business as usual. Now, it's not entirely as usual because we're doing a lot uh, of, by video now rather than in person. Uh, but uh, we should we should proceed as as much as possible. None of us want to have a huge backlog and all kinds of problems when this ends, and it will end at some point in time. Um, so moving forward, uh, being cooperative and setting up hearings as quickly as possible, uh, encouraging defendants to agree to consent to video recognizing that you know if a defendant is uncomfortable with it that's going to be fine with the court because we have to uh, respect that but at the same time uh, we really don't want to get behind uh, and uh, I want to make sure we are a court that is up to date with everything uh, when the emergency ends to the greatest extent possible and I might add that you know we're seeing some defendants who are not detained a declining consent uh, to proceed to sentencing. And I understand that, and no one probably wants to go into the Bureau of Prisons at this point in time. And I've been encouraging the judges to set report dates uh, well after September 1st, so uh, we can extend that. Uh, if we need to, we can extend it for a long period of time if there is a risk in going into the Bureau of Prisons. I think it's better to get these uh, sentencing's done and to ask for a later report date uh, if a defendant is not in custody. If they are in custody uh, at Sherburne County or one of, the, one of the other detention facilities, obviously it makes sense to get them into the Bureau of Prisons where uh, there will be more programming and more uh, uh, just a, a better experience. We're not sending people, the Bureau of Prisons is not sending uh, people into prisons that have uh, the uh, the illness diagnosed. Uh, they're going into quarantine facilities for a while and then on to facilities that don't have any uh, infection. All four of our Minnesota institutions, Bureau of Prisons institutions, have no instances yet of COVID-19. Uh, our halfway houses are free of uh, COVID-19 right now. Uh, and our detention centers are. So everyone's doing a good job of making sure we can protect uh, individuals who need to be protected. All right, we have a couple questions from the in attendees here that I'm going to throw at you. Um, one question, has the court continued to hear cases for pro se parties? And how has that process uh, gone? for parties who maybe have more limited access to technology? Yeah, uh, you know, as you know that motions that we have are typically referred uh, from the district judge to the magistrate judge. That's a policy of the court. Uh, and, and magistrate judges have been handling hearings. Um, I think that uh, in those cases, they work with the individual. It might be that they simply are on the telephone for a hearing. And uh, audio conference is just fine. Uh, you know, many hearings have gone forward with audio conferencing. Uh, there's also the opportunity, if necessary, to come into the second floor conference room where there will be video equipment available uh, for a pro se a party to, to make their uh, argument to the, to the magistrate judge. So we're trying to do it as much as possible, recognizing that in those cases, it's probably a little bit more difficult than would normally be the case. But yes, we are proceeding with them. We have another question, and this is something actually that I've heard um, bantered about the bar as well, which is um, 
ensuring that defendants, criminal defendants are, are treated fairly. And I know the court always is concerned about treating them fairly, but I have heard in particular with the mask requirement that there may be some, some concerns about that. Has the court given in that any thought? The, the mask requirement uh, during a hearing, you mean? Uh, well, I mean, I encourage the, uh, when I have a hearing uh, involving a detained defendant uh, who's usually in uh, one of the uh, booking rooms uh, at Sherburne County, uh, I encourage them to take the mask off so I can clearly hear them. Some of them want to keep them on, which is perfectly fine. And I usually can hear them just fine. The, the microphones pick up their voices really well. Um, and uh, they have the assistance of a guard who's by the door who can come over and adjust the equipment if necessary. Uh, and they can, uh, they can request a private uh, meeting uh, during the hearing with their lawyers. And that works really well. The guard steps out of the room. They have the, the private uh, discussion. Uh, the interpreters can be involved in that as well. And I think um, uh, you know, my sense is that they feel like they've been treated fairly. Um, I, I'm constantly asking, can you hear if there's, if you can't hear something or you don't understand something, uh, please let me know right away. We'll go over it again. And I think it behooves the judges to be really careful to make sure that the defendant fully understands what's going on. And I felt good about the process so far. And I think that uh, defendants uh, seem to feel good about the process as well. Uh, from what uh, what they say during the hearing. And I think lawyers have felt that it's been a good experience. And how about for the criminal trials that you um, currently have scheduled for July? Um, that adds a different element um, to the process given that you have juries now um, and you probably have the defendant in the courtroom, although I guess I don't know that for sure. Um, and then potentially a, that, a requirement that everyone in the courtroom wear masks. Yeah, we, we don't have a plan yet for how we're going to do jury trials. We're working on that. Uh, there's some national guidance that uh, we expect to receive before too long. We have the experience of some other districts. Uh, I think that we will uh, work hard to make sure we don't have a full courtroom with uh, potential jurors who are uh, there. We'll use uh, more frequent use of questionnaires in advance. Uh, weeding out of jurors who probably would be excused anyway. Uh, maybe having jurors come, come in in small waves of people as opposed to a large group at one time. You know, we've, we've always had trials where we've questioned jurors individually in sensitive cases, and we can do that again now. It just takes a little bit longer uh, to pick a jury, but it probably is a safer method of doing it. Um, and so the courtroom configurations, we're working on that as well. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly where we will land in the end, but we may be uh, taking some of the juror chairs out and putting plexiglass in between. We've talked about that possibility. Um, and just uh, making sure we have uh, you know, plenty of space in the courtroom, moving the tables back toward the opposite wall. Um, you know, making sure that there's a safe distance between people. Uh, it's going to be experimental, and uh, the first couple of trials will probably be pilots to see what we can do better as we move forward. But I'm confident we can find a way to keep everybody safe and still uh, run a criminal and civil justice system, which is what uh, the public expects us to do. Um, one more question that came in about settlement conferences. Um, do you know if, how, well, it's how, what can lawyers expect with remote settlement conferences? Will the parties be put into separate virtual rooms, for example? Yes, the magistrate you... judges are, are doing a really good job with Zoom. Uh, Judge Cowan Wright uh, initially was doing it um, with uh, even before we got the licenses for the Zoom for government, she was using just a regular consumer Zoom and putting uh, the parties into their separate rooms. It, it actually, I'm told it works really, really well. You can expect to have separate rooms where everyone can be together for any uh, instructions from the magistrate judge. 
or you can have the magistrate judge talking to one room at a time uh, where there are people in different locations be part of that room. Uh, they can, I, I think everyone can expect that this is going to be an experience that is going to be much like the experience at the courthouse. It's just going to be virtual instead. And the, the magistrate judges have been raving about the technology and how easy it is to, to work the technology. And so I think you can expect an experience that is very similar to what you would normally have. Well, it looks like that is all the questions that have come in and I don't have any remaining questions. So I think that we will end the presentation here. Um, Judge, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for being willing to do this uh, presentation. It's definitely something that everybody is very curious about and really wants to know how things are working and how things will work going forward. So we very much appreciate your time. Yeah, and I, I would just add uh, that uh, if you haven't been part of a Zoom hearing yet, it's not something that you should fear. You know, you should, uh, you should practice ahead of time. You can call a courtroom deputy and try out your connection and make sure it works so you don't have any kind of technical snafu that gives you, um, you know, uh, a pain at the time when you're, you're trying to make an, an argument. Uh, but I will just say from the court standpoint, it's been working really well. And we're all understanding that technology sometimes works well and sometimes doesn't work well. We understand that. Uh, no one's gonna be upset if something doesn't work right, but uh, don't be afraid of it. Uh, it enables us to do our work in an era when we need to keep everyone safe and sound. That sounds great. Thanks again, Judge. Um, we appreciate it. And uh, we'll, I guess, see you via Zoom soon. <laughs> Well, we'll see you by Zoom. <laughs> yes, thank you.